Awesome. Well, as usual, standards have really drawn out the crowd, and I'm excited. I am excited because this is our first standards and specifications forum component at Open Source Summit, um, and I want to say a quick thank you to our program committee, which was comprised of folks from a lot of different organizations. This was certainly something that we all aligned on in terms of seeing the need to have conversations about the standards and specifications development communities across our organizations. And so quick thank you uh, for the recording, especially to Samina Hussein from ECMA International, um, Kelly Kulian from Oasis Open, Kim Hamilton Duffy from Distributed Identity Foundation, Seth Newberry from Standards Hub, and Mirko Boehm from LF Europe, who was unable to make it today. And of course, thank you to you all for coming to our sessions. Um, on the stage on Tuesday, Hillary Rich, uh, Carter from our uh, LF research team announced the State of Open Standards Survey. Would super appreciate you helping us circulate the survey and, of course, taking the survey yourself. You're the target audience for it. Um, so if you can uh, take the time, share this within your organizations or your um, TCs, your working groups, etc. I would really appreciate it. Um, last year's report was really exciting and certainly uh, something we learned a lot from doing this year. I promise it's a lot shorter, so. <laughs> um, and then lastly, before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to kind of give a little bit of a statement about the why. Um, why do a standards and specs uh, forum at Open Source Summit? I've personally been seeing a lot of um, interest and growth and in interest from our open source developer community in our standards and specifications projects that we host at the Linux Foundation, of which there are several hundred. Um, the team that I lead at the LF is all standards uh, professionals. We have about 30 projects that are strictly uh, standards developing uh, groups. And we've been asking ourselves, how can we help foster cross-organizational communities of practice where what they're doing in, say, a JDF project might be really helpful to another, another project, or what's happening with tooling in IETF and could, could be a lesson learned for, for one of our you know, uh, projects that are just getting started in specifications development on, on GitHub, say. Um, and so I hoped to invite uh, talks to this track that would help educate folks and help encourage that discussion. I think we succeeded in that. You guys can tell me later. Um, and then, you know, also how can we help find and support the next generation of standards uh, developers because that's really important for the future of these projects and of our um, organization. So um, I hope that you'll think about those questions too. I hope the talks help um, foster discussion on those. If you would like to consider also uh, answering a question of the sort. We have another um, CFP for this track for Open Source Summit Europe in Austria in September. Of course, would love to see your submissions there. Um, but now I'm gonna hand it over to my dear friend, Dan um, Applequist. Dan is the uh, co-chair of the W3C TAG, and he has been a great mentor to me. Oh. Uh, and um, a good friend. So I'm going to lead it over, hand it over to Dan to talk about the importance of wide review. Well, thank you, Jory. Um, you've been a really good mentor to me as well. So um, I'm really, really, I was really, you get to see all my tabs now. I was uh, greatly um, honored to be asked to submit a talk. Oh, I'm not sharing. Slideshow, woo, okay, there we go, right. So, um, and uh, Jory suggested that I do something about wide review because I think we are t uh, um, very active in thinking about wide review in uh, W3C. But just to, to um, introduce myself a little further, um, I wear, like many, like probably everybody at this conference, I wear many hats, um, I am, Open, an open source strategist for Samsung Open Source Group um, and who are uh, very nicely paying for me to be here. Um, and uh, I am also co-chair of the W3C Technical Architecture Group. I'll get into talking a little bit about what that is. 
Um, and I'm also a member of the Technical Advisory Council, the TAC, for the OpenSSF, which is uh, we've been hearing about a lot uh, this week at Open Source Summit um, because of the importance of security. I am going to talk a little bit about security in this talk as well. Um, so one question I wanted to start off with in addressing this topic is what future are we building? So why am I talking about the future? When we talk about standards, we are building things. We don't build things that people are using. We're not building the next widget. We're not building um, the next application. We're not building an, an, you know, an NFT site. Uh, we're not building um, anything like that. We're not building stuff that people are going to use. We're building that stuff so that people in the future can build things for other people, right? And so that is something that always makes standards a little bit um, ungraspable, ineffable in nature. I mean, when I try and uh, talk about what I do to my family or friends, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very abstract, right? Uh, technical standards. Okay, yeah, but what are, do we really do? We are building things that help to build the future. The things that we build build the future. And that is something that I think we really need to keep in mind when we think about what kind of future we want to build, right? Do we want to build a really nice future or do we want to build something like this, right? Okay, are, are, we, on tr are we on that track or are we on a different track? Are we trying to push actively as technologists towards a better future? Um, so I'll come back to him in a second. I had to put Ryan Gosling in here just because, you know, uh, you have to have a celebrity cameo. Okay, so standards are architecture. Um, I uh, one of the I always get a lot of flack from my friend uh, who is an actual architect, uh, like making buildings. About you know you you can't call yourself an architect. What is this architecture that you're doing? That's that's a, that there is a real thing called architecture. Yes, that's true. So um, we're talking about technical architecture here, and the definition of technical architecture can be fungible and can depend on what you uh, what you need at the time. Um, however, I, I think of architecture as being how systems interact with other systems, how things touch other things. Um, and that is often through interfaces. And so that's very often when we're talking about standards, we're talking about interfaces and we're talking about APIs. And so standards are architecture on top of which we build uh, we build other things. Standards, however, can't be developed in a vacuum. Uh, we cannot simply go away, um, build an API definition without any regard for what, uh, for what has gone on before, for what is going on elsewhere in the industry, and, and for what knowledge and understanding exists outside of the room that we're building this standard in. Um, and that's why wide review is essential. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is the case. So what facilitates wide review? I'm going to go through these in a little bit of detail. Um, open and why they facilitate wide review. And, and, and this is very opinionated. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that facilitates wide review is open access. So uh, it may seem intuitive or to some that when we are building standards, we're building them in a way that other people can see them, the work that we're doing. Well, that's not, that's not a, uh, necessarily uh, something that everybody, that um, is the way that everybody builds standards, but it's, it's incredibly important because it allows me to say, hey, Jory, can you uh, take a look at this draft? I'd really like your input on it, right? And without you having to like go through a paywall or some or log in or there being a you know a member it, it reduces the um, friction to being able to share what we're doing transparency of process is also important so that you can say to somebody uh, can you please you know we are reaching this particular gate in our process link here's the gate here's the process as documented and at this point we would really like your review because we're going to wide review so uh, knowing that and being able to point to the process and understand what the process is uh, is and what the different steps are is important too um, having a public comment process at all having public comment built into your process and saying uh, we must reply to public comments um, 
having the connections to other standards groups, other bodies. Jory talked about that a little bit in the intro, like being able to know if I need to reach out for a particular expertise that I don't have in the room, where do I go? Um, having an inclusive culture is important for wide review. And frankly speaking, this is because uh, if I reach out to you for wide review and you come back and you look at my repo or my mailing list um, and you see a bunch of infighting and you see a bunch of um, tech bros fighting with each other about some particular topic, then you're, you're going to be less likely and I would be less likely to respond as well. I would be, why should I give these people my expertise and time? Um, and that also goes with, uh, skipping forward, royalty-free licensing, um, which can be controversial, but I think it also makes a difference when you're asking somebody for their input. If that person, th that person doesn't have a, a commercial reason to, uh, but they may be more willing to give you their input um, if they know that what is being delivered here is not being delivered to, um, to, be, uh, to serve a particular commercial interest um, of a patent holder, but is more being used uh, to promote public good, to, um, to deliver something that will eventually produce something good, that will produce a good outcome, good future. Um, willingness to listen is extremely important for wide review because, guess what, if you send out uh, your specification draft for wide review, uh, you might get negative feedback. People might not like what you're doing. And uh, what's the right response to that? You cannot simply be defensive about it. That is a very human response. I've done it. Everybody's done it. Um, but you really need to listen and be willing to forensically examine feedback, even if it's presented in, a not, in what you feel is not a very friendly way. And understand what the person is saying and, and maybe extract value from it so that you can iterate. Um, that's certainly been an experience that I've had that has been very fruitful. And I would argue you also need to have published values. You need to, uh, and again, this is about signposting. This is a friendly environment. This is a place, this is a community where we're building this uh, thing. Um, so again, I'm, I'm gonna say inclusivity, transparency, and openness all facilitate wide review. And I think inclusivity can also mean having a published code of conduct, having a, um, having a good enforcement procedure behind your code of conduct and having a good reputation for, uh, for facilitating uh, inclusive discussions and community um, uh, can, can be. So otherwise you're gonna have people just evaporate out of your community and they will just leave and not tell you why they left. So you'll think, great, nobody's complaining. We don't need a code of conduct. We don't need to be more inclusive, but actually what you've, 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 you're, you're not creating a good environment for people to come and give you their, their feedback. And that kind of wide review uh, requires feedback from a diverse set of stakeholders. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we do in W3C in, in this regard. Um, first of all, W3C, what is W3C? World, the World Wide Web Consortium. A lot of people say WC3. I, it's W3 just means w, WWW, World Wide Web. So uh, W3C is, 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 is how we shorten it. Um, it's the standards organization that was started by Tim Berners-Lee, who is the inventor of the web um, for web standards. Um, it, it, things that come out of W3C include HTML. Um, now that is done in, in partnership with something with a splinter group called the Watt WG, but it's, it's pretty, you know, pretty cordial. Um, and then uh, CSS is another big deliverable for, uh, for W3C. Uh, JavaScript APIs aplenty, uh, just all kinds of JavaScript APIs, including security APIs, including um, web application APIs. And things like guidelines for accessibility, ARIA, which is another accessibility uh, tool for web applications, all of these things come out of W3C. And W3C runs out on, on a royalty-free patent policy. Um, and you can access it through the web. You can go to W3C at W3C.social on the Fediverse to find out more about them. So wide review in W3C broadly includes things like accessibility, which 
we shortened to A11Y. Uh, internationalization, which we shortened to IATN. Um, privacy, security, architecture and design. And when you are at certain uh, points in the process of building your standard, uh, you are invited to submit your standard or your specification for wide review within W3C. And this is what that page looks like. Um, and you can see what it's asking you. It's, it's asking you, you know, submit or read this, uh, read this material, look at this questionnaire, uh, submit a review request to the accessibility uh, platforms, the accessible platforms architecture group. Uh, for the architecture and design, uh, ask the tag, submit a, a review request. Uh, for internationalization, uh, go through this checklist, submit a review request. For privacy, uh, the same thing. Um, there's a number of documents that are, that are relevant to privacy and also for security. Um, and those requests go through uh, special review groups that we have set up in W3C. So there's the APA, Accessible Platform Architecture, an internationalization interest group, uh, the privacy interest group, which we call PING. Um, we have a new group being set up uh, for security, specifically security interest group. By uh, uh, There's been a new hire at W3C, a security lead, uh, who's very, uh, very actively opening up new groups and, and creating new uh, ways to uh, review things for security. And then we also have the technical architecture group, which is the group that I, that I co-chair, which does the general design um, review and architecture review. Um, so when we're talking about accessibility, what do we mean? Things like visual rendering, does author have control over color? Color is important for accessibility. Is there user input that's encoded into the specification? User interaction, document semantics, time-based visual media like uh, animations, for instance, which can be uh, rendered differently for different uh, accessibility needs, um, time limits on things. If you are visually disabled, you may not want to, you may need longer time to be able to uh, interact with a, a, a content or a document. Content fallback mechanisms, these are some of the kinds of things. I'm not going to go through each one of these in, in great detail. But just to give you a flavor, internationalization, you know, is there natural language text? Is there character encoding specified in this, in this spec? Uh, typographically appealing text, so therefore you need some kind of rich text format, and how does that work, and how does that work with international uh, formats? Does it work with vertical text, which is extremely important for some countries? Um, capturing user input, uh, names, addresses, time and date formats, right? Like, I live in the UK, uh, I'm coming here to the US, you know, it is still the case, like 20 years after I moved over there, that people still don't know that other people in the rest of the world don't represent a date in this way, that it, you, know, it's, it, you need to use an internationally applicable format. Um, and uh, cultural norms, are cultural norms built into the specification that, uh, that, you're blind, that you have blind spots to because that's your culture? Um, privacy and security, have you, have you uh, made use of uh, data minimization as a as a design principle. Um, do you have personal, do you deal with personally identifiable information in the specification? Do you have data that persists across browsing sessions? Um, are you accessing underlying platform features like text messaging, uh, making a call, uh, listening to the microphone, stuff like that? Um, that can be extremely important for privacy. Uh, geolocation is another one. Uh, functionality in private modes. What, do, what is your specification saying about how this technology should behave if the user selects, I'm, I want to be more private, I'm in a private mode now? Um, privacy, do you have a privacy and security consideration section? So these are some of the things that we look at for, for privacy and security. Um, and when do you do wide review? Well, it kind of depends, right? It depends. We, we like, we have certain gates and that page that I, presented earlier with all the different review request options, which by the way, I should have said, each one of those opens up an issue in GitHub. All of this stuff is done in the clear and you can see all of these review requests and you can, um, and, and each one of those has an issue template that guides people through it. So it's quite, so it looks daunting, but it's not that daunting because you get guided through, through the process. But when, 
um, if you're going for wide review uh, at one of these gates where say, okay, we're ready for wide review. We're, we've, we've delivered something, we've delivered a beta, now we want more review. Well, then you, you would go through that process. Um, but maybe uh, you want some wide review or, or some aspect of wide review um, very early on uh, because you're, you want to sense check something. And in the tag, we get a lot of review requests that are early design review requests where somebody has developed something, maybe they have an early prototype, maybe they are demonstrating it. Um, within one implementation, um, but they want to get our view of how this works, how this fits in. Um, so that's where we come to tag review and how that works uh, specifically. So in tag, what is tag? We're a special technical architecture group is what it stands for. We're a special group that's defined in W3C process. We are, a, a majority of the tag is elected. Um, so that means that we kind of represent the membership uh, and we have a kind of mandate to help uh, guide the architecture of the web. We have eight elected representatives, um, three appointed uh, people that are appointed by the team. Um, we have one team contact, which is to say an employee of W3C. And then technically, we also have Tim Berners-Lee on the tag. It's, we, we like to have him there um, because it gives us a little bit of, um, uh, I don't know, name recognition, but, uh, but uh, you know, Tim is, is in, he's an emeritus chair, um, and in reality, he's kind of stepped back from W3C. Um, we conduct design reviews, we write findings and principles documents. Um, we're not charted to produce standards. That's important. The tag uh, doesn't produce itself standards. It doesn't have an IP framework for producing standards. So, um, so and we play a role in cross-organizational liaisons, like, for instance, with uh, JDF and, and other organizations, IETF, um, ECMA, and uh, WhatWG. So what's required in a tag review this is a little uh, text heavy, sorry, um, but uh, I wanted to put this in for those reading the slides online. Um, we ask that they review the design principles, the privacy principles. These are some of the things that TAG has written, the guidelines documents. We ask that they write an explainer. An explainer is a simple language document which uh, uses a uh, language that anybody can understand and it does not start with terms of art and things that are very specific to the, uh, to the specification or to the technology area that you're working in, but it starts with user needs. What user need does this fill? Um, and that's important. Getting people to think about user needs uh, helps us to ensure that everything is built according to servicing a user need. Um, any user research that's available that demonstrates this need for this thing, answers to the security and privacy review questionnaire, that's another ar artifact of the tag. Who are the contacts? Who are actually the people that we should be getting back to about the feedback? Where is the work being done? What, what, work, what working group is it being done in? Is it being done in a community group? Is it being done in some random GitHub repository? Which is okay, right? You know, as long as it has a trajectory. What is the trajectory for this work? Where is it going to go? And that, that's something that's important for us to track. Um, what organization is driving the work? So uh, is it being driven by one particular browser maker? Is there, al are, is there already a multi-stakeholder um, consensus around this? Um, is there evidence of multi-implementer support? Multi-implementer support is extremely important in W3C. Um, and lastly, what do you need help with? What, you know, guide us a little bit and, and tell us, well, uh, we've come to this conclusion. We have, uh, you know, developed this, but we really need help thinking about wh uh, the particular API surface or um, are we doing everything right by privacy and security? And that, it, that really helps to drive our review, uh, review work. So again, explainers start with user needs. That's an extremely important thing that I really want to kind of double down on. Um, and that is because uh, we have something called the priority of constituency, which I will talk about in a second. Um, so what happens in a, in a design review? Uh, we triage the user requests, we assign people, we discuss it in a breakout, we write feedback, we encourage them to articulate the user need, usually. Um, we encourage stakeholder engagement. Hey, you really need to talk to this other group. You need to talk to that other implementer. Um, you need to get their feedback. 
we point out issues, we offer design advice, we encourage additional wide review. We say, hey, you really should go get a wider, uh, an accessibility review from the accessibility group. You should get a privacy and security review from the security team or from the privacy team. Um, and then we conclude either with a satisfied, satisfied with concerns, and we'll articulate what those concerns are, or uh, unsatisfied. And, and unsatisfied is really a failure state. We don't want to be telling people don't do this. We would much rather guide them to a state where, where we like uh, what, they've, uh, what they've written and they like our feedback. But we don't stop work from happening. The tag doesn't have formal authority to stop anybody doing anything. Um, so we like it that way. We want people to listen to our feedback and to come to us for feedback rather than see us as a blocker or, a, or uh, somebody who's putting stop energy on them. Um, so we've completed 43 reviews so far this year, which gives you an idea of some of the cadence of work in W3C and in the web, by the way. There's a lot of new work and a lot of new APIs that are coming to the web um, all the time, which uh, is one reason I think this area is extremely exciting. Um, so I talked about the priority of constituencies. Let me drill down on that. That's a kind of core W3C philosophy, um, and I'll just read it out. So user needs, again, come before the needs of web page authors, which come before the needs of user agent implementers, that's browser makers um, for, for us, uh, which come before the needs of specification writers, so the, the people that are actually like in this room that, or that are writing the specs, and which also comes before theoretical purity. And that's something that really uh, helps to drive everything that we, that we have done in terms of building, uh, building out design principles, our privacy principles, our wide review uh, process. Everything kind of comes back to, uh, to this priority of constituencies, which was, which was imported into our design principles in the tag from another document called the HTML uh, uh, design principles, which uh, came before it. So this is this goes back to like 1994, kind of time frame around the start of W3C. Um, but we realized in the tag that we need to go beyond this. So uh, we started some work in 2019 around ethical principles for the web, and it started with an idea. Uh, we already have these ethics encoded into the web platform. We already have a culture of internationalization. We have a culture of privacy. We have a culture of um, looking out and, uh, and uh, accessibility, looking out for, for people, the um, marginalized communities um, to, to that degree. So why not write these things down and actually start to guide our work from principles that are, that are built uh, along those lines? Um, and it also is uh, thinking about things in terms of building a firm foundation for the architecture that itself that we're building. So these are some of the ethical principles that we came up with, and um, this is just, there's a lot more detail, or a fair amount more detail. We didn't, we didn't want to write an extremely detailed document, so it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty uh, uh, small document, actually. But basically, we're saying there is one web, uh, the web should not cause harm to society. Uh, we should support healthy community. The web is for all people. So again, internationalization, accessibility, but also marginalized groups. Respect people's privacy. The web is a secure environment. Uh, it enables freedom of expression. Um, the web is transparent. That is to say, uh, you can see what's going on when you visit a web page. Uh, you can ex you can examine uh, what's going on. You can go. You can open up Dev Tools and and you know you can view source. Uh, po it's possible to verify the provenance of information that you see uh, through the web. Uh, and the web should enhance individuals' control and power and be a sustainable platform. Right now, that's a challenge, but these are aspirational goals. Um, the web needs to be multi-browser, multi-OS, multi-device. That's a key. Uh, ethical principle for us. Um, and people may render content as they wish. And this is one thing that also goes back to accessibility because if you have uh, a web page and you need to, you might need to fiddle with the colors in order to make it uh, look, uh, in order to make it usable, readable for you. Um, things like that. So 
these are core principles that we can build actionable principles on top of. They, the principles, these themselves, are not actionable, but then we refer back to these from other documents like the design principles and privacy principles and that kind of thing. Um, but we're not ethicists, right? Ethicists, ethicists, eth we're not bad. Um, and uh, so, so how can we as technologists, uh, you know, hope to build um, ethical principles, right? What, what gives us the right, what gives us the bravado to, to, uh, to write a document that is the tag ethical principles? Um, well, we employed uh, the, pro the process of wide review, right? And, the, and, the, and, and we reached out to tech ethicists. We wrote some stuff down. We reached out to tech ethicists in, in our community and we got feedback. We got wide review. And some of that wide review was, you don't know what you're talking about. And some of it was, um, actually, this looks really good. You need to tweak this wording. This is a loaded word. Don't use that. Um, things like that. This fits in well. Um, and, and that, by that uh, feedback, we, we started to get a little bit more confident that we were doing the right thing here because we, we started to hear from tech ethicists in academia and other places. Um, and we, we also sense checked this against some IE, IEEE um, uh, documents and, uh, and frameworks um, that uh, what we were doing there was, what we were doing here is not so much being out on a limb, that we were um, doing the right thing. Um, right. And one thing that also drives this work is the belief that technology without ethics makes social inequality worse. Um, and that is really where we, uh, where we come to our uh, gentleman here from, uh, from the future, right? Like we don't want to be producing a future um, that, uh, that creates more social inequality, that creates more problems for people. Uh, we want to be produce, we want to be taking into account uh, things like uh, human rights when we are actually um, building out standards that we produce. And, uh, and that's something that we encoded into the document where um, we, we actually talk about human rights. So, but the question is, what do standards have to do with human rights? Okay, I'm a really, I'm real, I've really taken you on a journey here and now we're talking, you know, we started with like security and now we're talking about human rights? What's going on here? Okay, so uh, let me, let me, take you through my thinking on this. Uh, technical standards are about people. Uh, technical standards are rules that tell systems what to do and what they can't do. And therefore, they can tell people what they can and can't do, okay? Uh, technical standards encode requirements about privacy, transparency, security, encryption, internationalization, and accessibility. Those are all things that, uh, that also have to do with, you, with people's freedoms. Um, and uh, technical standards can either be built to accommodate the needs of people outside the mainstreams of society, marginalized groups, people that you might not be thinking about, uh, uh, people in countries that have more um, severe limitations on their internet usage or more severe limitations on their rights. Um, or they can, be, they can choose to ignore those needs. You can say that's an edge case, right? Technical standards can be built to resist surveillance, uh, and that can either be state surveillance or corporate surveillance, uh, or they can be built to accommodate surveillance, right? So these are choices that we make, and, and they are political choices. All human endeavors are political. There's no, uh, there's no choice that we make that, uh, about building standards, building the future, that is not inherently a political standard, is, is my argument. Um, one case study, uh, dating back to 2014, was this uh, workshop that we ran. So we had uh, the tag and others identified there was a problem happening. Um, you know, Snowden uh, came along and told us all about um, government snooping that was happening, pervasive monitoring, uh, where unencrypted data was being hoovered up uh, and put in databases and queried. And, uh, and really, is this something we want? Is this, is this, is this something that we, that we want the web to, uh, to enable, the internet to enable? So the, uh, there was an IETF document that came out, pervasive monitoring is, a, is an attack, is an attack on the way that people are meant to be using the internet. It's an attack on the promise that we've given internet users, really. Um, and so we worked with W3C team, with IAB, um, with colleagues and other, uh, with uh, uh, in academia and other places and put on a workshop 
workshops, uh, the strengthening the internet workshop strength uh, in London, and I actually hosted this workshop, uh, and I was the one who like ran around with coffee urns and and you know made sure that everybody had coffee and stuff like that. Um, and uh, and one of the things that the tag did at that point was we issued a finding securing the web, which was about uh, trying to dispel in some cases some of the myths around the move to HTTPS. Um, and now, guess what? I mean, do not not necessarily all due to this workshop, but this workshop was one point in uh, in in the or, or one input and one thing that moved the needle, I think, in helping people to understand that we need to move to HTTPS, we need to move to a secure web, and now the majority of the web is encrypted. We don't even think about it. Um, it's weird when you go to a non-encrypted URL and, you, and you're like, wait, what's this? It's a non-encrypted. That's weird. I might, yeah. So that's good. Good result. Okay. But that's an inherently a political, uh, a, a political decision and, a political, and political thinking was driving this. Like, how do we make sure that um, governments Governments might say it's legal what we're doing. And the tech community had to say, you know what, it might be legal, but actually it's not ethical and it's not the future that we want to build. Um, so one thing that we have in the ethical web principles is this uh, quote, uh, internationally recognized human rights need to be placed at the core of the web platform. Um, so what do we mean by internationally recognized? Standards are transnational. We need to understand that as well. When I talk to people about human rights, they're like, yeah, uh, the, the Third Amendment, the First Amendment, whatever, you know, this, this or that amendment. I don't even remember which amendment is, is, is which. But um, uh, no, it's not about any particular country's view of human rights. We need, to under, we need to drive this from nationally, internationally recognized human rights. And that's where things like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights come into play. And you can read this document, have a look, um, you'll see that much of it is reflected in the way in the way that most places where you want to live are 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 set up, um, and I, I think it's a, it's it's quite a good document, and it and it stands the test of time, honestly speaking. It's a little, it can be a little dated in, in sections, but it's good. Um, so we were very happy to see that the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights recommended, or actually came and spoke to us at. Uh, the advisory committee of the W3C uh, last week in Hiroshima. Um, and they quoted that quote uh, in their talk and in the paper that they wrote about uh, the value of human rights in, uh, in international standards and in international standards development. So it was very uh, kind of like validating for us because here was somebody coming from the actual human rights space who was saying, hey, we really like what you did. And they also pointed out that we had a great code of conduct in W3C and that we were being an inclusive environment. Um, uh, so they actually came out in this document, um, which was published like late last year, I think, um, uh, which talks about human rights in technical standards bodies. Um, they have a number of recommendations for uh, technical standards orgs put in place adequate human rights due diligence process, um, adopt policy commitments to respect human rights, actually encode human rights into the policy and, and uh, into, your, um, into your values, into your published values, you know, review uh, operations in order to assess how they affect the enjoyment of human rights, um, make standard setting process as transparent, open, and inclusive as possible. Um, so I'll, I'll say again, inclusivity, Transparency, openness, facilitate wide review. Um, and wide review informed by ethics and human rights contribute to a better future. Um, and you can too. So I challenge everybody who's watching this to come up with your own priority of constituencies. You know, our priority of constituencies and ethics principles have to have a lot to do with the web and the and what we're building in the web. But every domain uh, technical standards domain that we're working on has probably something similar. Think about what that is. Build ethics principles according to those. Think about um, reading that document from the UN and seeing what uh, resonates with you. And if you can make use of it, if you can reference it, great. Um, we all need to do better to, uh, to create a better future, so thanks. And I'll take any questions if anybody has any.
Thanks. Great talk. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask if you could say uh, a little bit more um, about uh, in the point of wide review, right? You yes. sense one of the goals of the uh, tag review has to do with ensuring wide review and getting pointers to other places and, and tag deals with liaisons and so on. Right. So can you talk about more about the uh, wide review process that the W3C uses for how to decide whether to get wide review from other standards organizations? Like, is that done at the interest group level? Is that something that the tag is in charge of? What's the process that you decide to say, is this something that only requires um, W3C review or we need input from ECMA or IUTF or something else and just I mean I don't think that. we have a formal uh, way to decide that we would expect that if some uh, group uh, is building a specification that for instance uh, heavily uh, relies on HTTP um, or heavily has an interaction with uh, with HTTP that we would expect that they would be engaging with H with the HTTP working group um, and and therefore and getting feedback from that group on their use of HTTP um, how, however if that goes to tag review, tag the idea is that tag would catch that, you know, um, that we would really say, hey, it, it looks like you're you you might want to get feedback from HTTP, uh, and and we would loop in because we have members or ex members of the tag that are all, that are already members of the, um, you know, are and have been members of the ITF community, uh, including the HTTP working group chair, or um, so, uh, so we would we would pull in the, the people or you know facilitate that, really help. We wouldn't just send them and say, hey, you need to go talk to IETF. We, we would help and handhold them uh, to get that feedback, um, ideally. And, and the same goes for things like JavaScript, uh, where, um, where we ask them to go talk to TC39. And we say, OK, well, you want, might want to talk to this person in TC39 you know, and, and get that feedback. So yeah, it's really, it's really at tag reviews that we would formalize that. But we would hope that the working group would already kind of have that have that understanding. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Um, other questions? Oh, time? Oh, OK. So uh, she's calling time. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Dan. No worries.